George Clooney and Brad Pitt's new movie, Wolves, is on Apple TV Plus September 27th. That's where I want you to be now. So if you want to see George Clooney and Brad Pitt, go to Apple TV Plus. You got to start the story there. Or if you want to see Brad Pitt and George Clooney, go to Apple TV Plus. I am enjoying the show. And if you want to see their new movie, Wolves, you can't do it. I'm going to help you out. I can do it. So do it. Definitely go to Apple TV Plus. Admit it. It's cool. Okay, fine. It was very cool. Wolves, streaming September 27th on Apple TV Plus. Rated R. When it comes to towing, seeing is believing. That's why Chevy Trucks Advanced Camera Technology offers up to eight available cameras for 14 unique views, so you can focus on the view that really matters. Chevrolet, together let's drive. Learn more about Chevy Trucks at Chevy.com. Safety or driver assistance features are no substitute for the driver's responsibility to operate the vehicle in a safe manner. Read the vehicle owner's manual for important feature limitations and information. This episode is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Turn your ideas into reality with an Azure free account. Get everything you need to develop apps across cloud and hybrid environments, scale workloads, create cloud-connected mobile experiences, and so much more. Discover what you can create with popular services free for 12 months. Learn more at azure.com. That's A-Z-U-R-E dot com. And sign up for a free account to start building in the cloud today. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello, welcome to AI Scouted on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Dave Hendrick, joined as always by Mr. Carl Matchett. How are you, sir? Late, but guy's fault, so I'm pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's easy to blame the the producer isn't it um but no you were just late that's just how it was i'd like to point out i was here on time which makes your lateness all the more scandalous yeah. um we thought what we'd do today is obviously we'll take a look at west ham which takes place tomorrow night but maybe start off around europe where all the big leagues are getting their seasons up and running uh we're seeing some surprising results some teams have fallen off from last season some that were maybe expected to fall off have had particularly good starts let's start with La Liga Carl where Barcelona six wins from six 22 goals scored only five conceded Hansi Flick has them really humming but they lost Marc-Andre Ter Stegen to a season ending injury a torn patella tendon which is probably the worst injury a professional footballer can have. And they do have a certain club from Madrid who are only four points behind them. And while it's still a little bit clunky for Real, I do think it's starting to smooth itself out and we will see in the coming weeks that team really start to kick into gear. Uh, Thoughts on those two and anything else from Spain that jumps out at you? Um, so Barca first, I think the setup that they've put themselves in is a pretty good one. It looks a lot more handsy flick than Barcelona, if we can say it that way around. Like there's a most of the time there's been a pretty clearly defined number ten. There's been a pretty clearly defined line of three to support the forward rather than a front three. Um, like you said, perfect in terms of domestic wins. But I think the most impressive part of that is the injuries that he's had to be coping with in midfield. Like his ideal midfield is like gone three times over sort of thing. Barca have had a number of injuries. They've lost uh, Danny Olmo now as well uh, for a, a few weeks at least. But like uh, Marc Benar came in at the start of the season. He's now out probably for the entire campaign. Gavi is still out. Frankie de Jong is still out. Christensen, who's playing the holder midfield, he's out. Fermin Lopez, who's come in and out and sort of be the, one of the attacking midfielders, he's out now. So it's really difficult to just keep finding solutions. It does help him. One of those solutions is Pedri, of course. Like we can't just say it's mm. been 
like absolute fodder or you know inexperience going in there but alongside Beardy has now been like a succession of young players Marcus Ardo is the latest one who's gone in there and well he looks he looks all right doesn't he um so there's there's really good potential let's say for for the next new players to come through and look like they're going to get a, a decent crack at being part of this rebuilt Barcelona side and with Kubasi still in there, Yamal obviously as young as he is, Alex Balde getting time, and now Nyaki Benya is going to be the standing keeper as well. Um, mm. uh, Stegen, like you say, at least until January. Um, I'm not sure about registrations if they sign up a free goalkeeper. Maybe they'll be allowed that as like a dispensation. That kind of happens quite a bit. Um, so at least he should get a couple of games before they sort that out anyway. So I think he's done really well. Uh, obviously they lost in the Champions League, but as we've been over several times, that doesn't matter. Plenty of time for uh, for that to be recovered, and that was mostly down to a test taken mistake anyway. Um, so yeah, I think they've been very, very impressive. I think there's lots more to come from them. Um, I mean, I know the Champions League is obviously where the money and the prestige is, but I think for Hansi Flick this year, I don't think it would be a bad thing if he just kind of focused entirely on La Liga results, to be honest. Um, that Champions League progression will come anyway. They'll definitely be let's say, a playoff team, and then you can worry about the actual playoff at the time um, and sort of judge by who you're playing and who you're playing around it. But I, I think they've got enough attacking and enough of a structure here, which is the thing that they were missing most of all previously, to quite, kind of go the distance, to be honest, if they don't sort of lose a key, key players like... I love Indovsky, obviously, because he plays up front, but like Rafinha has been really important for them. Uh, Bedri, obviously, now, and Jules Kunle as well, has, has had a good start to the season, so... I think if they can keep a few of those key players fit and just focus on the league, that's a, there's a really good opportunity for them to take the title to most of the distance at least. Um, I agree with what you say about Real, but I'm still a little bit not all that high on sort of the combination between midfield and forward line at the minute. Um, I think it's perhaps overly offensive at times, like against mm-hmm. some of the fodder, they've gone super attacking, like five attackers and a central midfielder, not even a holder midfielder. I think a, a few of the clubs in the top half might have a bit more of a go at them than they've been tested with so far. Um, and that will be interesting. But they also have probably the best attackers collection-wise in the world. So can't argue too much against uh, being on the front foot. Around the other clubs, um, Valencia obviously have had a dismal start to the season. Sevilla, I think, are just a finished shadow now for the last sort of two years. And that doesn't look like changing too much. Um, Girona obviously dealing with Champions League and expectation and obviously losing a couple of players as well they lost um, Dov Big right before the end of the window Savinio obviously from last season um, a couple of others there from midfield as well have gone Terence Garcia was there like there's, there's, there's quite a few they had it on loan as well that they didn't get back so that it's been tough for them yeah it will be tough I think if they sort of get anywhere sort of top 8 and have a good time in the Champions League that's great basically you know if they can get themselves European football again fine um, but looks like obviously Atletico have got a really really deep strong squad again this year hopefully they sort of figure out that way to just keep winning at home at the very least and, and make it a bit more interesting so just a few things on on Barca I fully agree with you on the Champions League when you look at their fixtures they play young boys at home Red Star Belgrade away Brest at home and they go away to Benfica, that they're all games they should win. And that should be enough. Like I think was it it's ten points basically is what'll get you a a spot in the in the playoff at least. So if they beat young boys Bar, um, Red Star and Brest and pick up a draw in one of the other games, like that well that will get them through and that's probably gonna be enough. Um I do agree with Real what you said. I I think <clears throat> like what I think of what I would do with that team, I think you'd be looking at probably going with some sort of diamondy type midfield where you put Chumeni at the base, Valverde and Camavinga as the engine, and Bellingham as the ten behind Kylian Mbappe and Vinicius Junior. I think that gives you balance, and then you can go with Carvial, Militao, Rudiger, and. Ferland Mendy or David Alaba as your back four, or you could play Alaba in the middle, whichever you want. Like that to me is probably their best eleven. 
there's obviously been some injuries. Camavinga's out at the moment, and they're trying to get Rodrigo as many minutes as possible because he's been a bit sulky, and they're trying to get Arda Guler up to speed and make sure that, you know, if and when they need him during the season, that he's ready to go. And make it, we know he's an immense talent. But I don't, yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think he's been a little bit, arrogant is not the right word because I don't think Ancelotti's ever arrogant, but he's been a little bit too dismissive maybe of some of the opposition and he's gone with yeah Cavalier is exactly the word like he's almost just dismissing some of this opposition as if oh we'll just beat them on talent and maybe it's just a matter of trying to get everybody minutes and get them up to speed and and, you know get them into the the home of the season but I, I think he'll figure it out I do um well saucy dad Carl Five points from seven games. One win, two draws, and four defeats. Now, bearing in mind, all the teams below them have only played six games. It's not outside the realms of possibility that they could find themselves in the relegation zone in a week or two. Now, it will mean nothing because it's so early in the season, but that's not really what Martin Zubimendi agreed to stay for. (laughs) And I, I'd imagine he's having some some regrets. Let's just say he's having some regrets about his decision. Um, we did manage to sign Georgi Mamardashvili. Now, Valencia have made a rotten start, but he has been tremendous. He's just playing in a team that really and truly looks completely devoid of confidence, devoid of a plan, devoid of any sort of leadership. Do you have any concerns for either of them across the course of the season? No. No, I don't across the course of the season, but it's very early and, you know, we've, we've said that about, you know, teams before, obviously. Uh, I mean, for, for La Real, I kind of look at the teams that they haven't got results again, let's say. Um, Alaves, they lost to, and Alaves have made a really strong start to the season, in, in fairness, so... You know, you can not overlook it, but there's a reason behind that defeat at the very least. Real Madrid, fine, whatever. Mallorca is the other one, like their their recent defeat. Let's say they lost one nil at Mallorca, but again, Mallorca have started really well and they're up in fifth. So it's not good, but I don't hold concerns at the minute long term. Obviously, there's plenty to sort out. Not scoring goals is a a big problem at the minute. Um, I can't say that I'm deeply concerned, but like four games without scoring a goal is problematic in itself. That's the mm. first thing to sort out. But I do think that there's, you know, if we're talking relegation terms, certainly worse clubs than them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and look, from a, from a Zubimendi point of view, he himself is playing really well. And from a Mamar Dashili point of view, he's playing really well. So... We can be confident that our talent identification in the summer was good. And I wouldn't be surprised if we go back for some Mendy in January. Do you wanna do you wanna put a little prediction there if we were to go back in for him? Do you think it would be the same fee? Um mid season, but them not doing well, let's see. Would do you think would they ask for more is what you're asking? No, I think would we go for less? Or would we offer less? Um, Because it was about release clause anyway, wasn't it? So, Yeah, apparently we were offering a couple million more than the release clause, but yeah, favourable terms, obviously. Um, No, I think we'd probably go back in around the same. We, 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 like, depending on him, it might just be a case where we do the release clause, where we, you know, get him to trigger his release clause. Because he's the one, ultimately... It's going to be triggered by him if he wants to move. And he knows what the situation is. He knows what Real Sociedad have said. Like, you have to trigger the release clause. They made they wanted him to be the prick. Because every time a player over the last 10 years in, Sir- in La Liga, and there hasn't been a whole lot, but every time a player has triggered the release clause, their club has painted them, the selling club has painted them as an arsehole. Every single time, no matter the circumstance. 
So he knows that that's what they that that's what they tried to do to him. They also made him a lot of promises about new contracts and players that were going to sign, and none of that took place. There's been no contract. Those talks died within a week, by all accounts. They didn't sign the players that they had said they were going to look for. So he's been let down by them. And with six months to think about it, especially if we're in a really strong position, like let's say we get to January and we're on, you know, 44, 45, 46 points after 19 games. Let's say we're progressing well in the Champions League. And all of the doubts that might have cir- uh, circled around Liverpool, you know, what will they look like without Klopp? All of those doubts might be lifted and he might be even more certain that it's the right move for himself. And maybe then he says, you know what, I can live with I can live with them trying to paint me as an arsehole. People will know the truth. And we just do the release clause. And on the evidence of so far... I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN make sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. From cozy breakfast nooks to formal dining areas, Ashley has versatile dining options starting at just $499.99. And for a limited time only, you can receive a $250 mattress credit with the purchase of any six-piece bedroom set. Plus, get 60 months special financing on select in-store purchases made with your Ashley Advantage Synchrony credit card. Shop and save today, only at Ashley. Subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. No minimum purchase required. See Ashley.com for details. The city of poor performance wise and and tactics wise, would you be in favor of a return for it? That's the other yeah. side of the question. Yeah, I think so. I mean look, Gravenberg is playing is playing well. There's no question there. Um but there's two key aspects of that role that he's not performing well. One of them is central progression, being able to find McAllister and Sabal's light through the middle. So much of his passing is to the fullbacks. To the centre backs, he's not progressing the ball well centrally with his passing. He's progressing it brilliantly with his carrying, but he's not progressing it well centrally with his passing. And the other side of it is defensively. And I know people will want to jump and shout about interception numbers. Interception numbers are not a sign of somebody defending well. They're largely a sign of the other team not being able to pass the ball particularly well. But we're too easy to play through at the moment. And part of that is just Gravenberg not knowing where he's meant to be and being too reactive to either the ball or a man. Zugamendi fixes both of those problems. Now, he doesn't offer some of the things Gravenberg op- offers. He doesn't have the same type of size, the same type of physicality. And that's been brilliant from him this year. Like the physicality Gravenberg is showing, that's by far the biggest improvement he's made. It's like a light bulb went on. Like, oh, my talent isn't actually going to be enough. And having flopped at Bayern, I now risk flopping at Liverpool. And they're looking to bring somebody else in. And now I don't know where I'm going to play. Oh, I've got an opportunity now. I'm going to have to go all out. And it's like something clicked with him. And now he's playing like a fella who's got that size, who's got that power, who's got that speed. Like, the technical side is all the same stuff we were seeing from last year. It's just that he's added a physicality to it and it's a lot more 
it's a lot more frequent and it's a lot more like the, the carrying is a lot more effective this year. Like he's not turning away at the first sign of contact. He's driving through players now, which is really, really impressive to see. So you do lose a bit of that, but there's other ways to rejig the midfield and figure things out that maybe you get him in the team as well as Zudamendi and Alexis McAllister. Um, but yeah, I would go back for, for Zudamendi without question. And a final note on Robin Birch, did you, uh, did you particularly enjoy late in the sort of second half or midway through the second half uh, when he robbed the ball inside his own half and just knocked at the other side of a midfielder and ran? Yes. <laughs> yes, just knocked it past him and then like, I'm, I'm a better athlete than you are. I thought that. And, okay. I thought and that you can't do anything to stop him. That just said confidence. That's all. That yeah. Said. Yeah. That was either I'm going to run past you or I'm going to run through you. But either way, the ball's on the other side of you. And the only thing you can do to stop me is foul me. And even if you do that, I might just keep going anyway. Mm. So yeah, no, that was that was genuinely very very good. Um. So yeah. Anyway, moving on. Bundesliga. Uh, Bayern are the only team with four wins from four. Leverkusen, Freiburg and Eintracht Frankfurt have all won three with one defeat. Uh, Leipzig and Union Berlin have started out unbeaten, two wins, two draws. Stuttgart and Dortmund sitting seventh and eighth. Um, Stuttgart absolutely trucked Dortmund. I'm not sure if you've seen the, uh, the highlights from the weekend, but 5-1, a uh, rather comprehensive ass-kicking for, for Borussia Dortmund. Not sure that will have sat too well with the fans. Um, nobody really surprisingly underperforming. I mean, you could look at Wolfsburg and Gladbach, but they're very up and down the last few years. I think Heidenheim have started well. Two wins, two defeats, but, you know, I think that's pretty good for them. Um, Freiburg, new manager after a long time with one manager. Surprising start maybe at, at the top, but what stood out for you there? Um, honestly, the first thing which stands out, and although you would expect it because of, you know, money and all the rest of it, <clears throat> um, buying very quickly, integrating attackers into the side, getting really good results out of them, basically. Um, the use of Michael Lisa and Jamal Musiala, sometimes in a, in a three across, but also a couple of times we've seen them both kind of playing different roles as a number 10 centrally. Mm. Um, that's been really, really good to see, uh, unless you're obviously playing against them or the test by Munich. That's not so good to see then. I mean, the attacking options that they have right now in that, let's say, supporting role to Kane is, is quite ridiculous, to be honest. And if company can sort out a defensive pairing which doesn't make mistakes which at the minute despite the results I would say has not been the case like Kim a couple of times already we know what Opa Meccano is like um, there's, there's still errors there and they seem his uh, is much preferred to if he can sort them out they will be a force in the Champions League because just purely because of the absolute options speed that they have um, it's it's very very scary when they all get going and when they're all playing really well. Uh, Elise has started on fire like that's clearly a really really good move for him. Even now you can see it. They trust him. He's back. He's straight into the side. He has a role. He's able to showcase. He's, he's scoring goals. All the rest of it. But then Musiala and Coman are starting quite regularly. Tell started at the start of the season. Sane is coming back from injury. Nabri is there. Obviously, that it's just. It's a lot. It's a lot to, to hold at bay all game long if one's coming on for the other and for the other and for the other. And yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing a bit more of them as the season goes on because they, they they could be a big threat, but depends a lot on the, uh, let's say, protection and arrangement of the defence. Um, outside of them, a little bit disappointed in Leipzig. Maybe not quite up to the level of, of previous seasons. There's, there's obviously been a bit of a a sluggish start for them. Uh, a couple of nil nils, a one nil, and a three two. Even though the three two was against Leverkusen, which is obviously a very good result. Dortmund, I've only seen two of theirs, and they played you know four and whatever else in in cups. But I'm not sure 
at the minute about sign. Um, don't know what you think about him as a, as a coach or if you've seen much of what other people have said about him or that, but it looks a bit wide open to me. Um, it looks very idealistic at the moment without, but like, this was all, I, I don't know how anyone would be surprised by this. Like, this is how Antalya Spore played under him. And he's still so inexperienced. Like, the guy was playing three years ago. He didn't have any time between his playing career and his coaching career. He literally went to Antalya Spore as a player and had like, I think, three months as a coach and was just given the manager's job. Mm. Like, he hasn't had time to really learn how to be a coach. He hasn't had time to develop the fundamental principles of what he wants. He's got a lot of good ideas, and some of the possession stuff is really good. Like, it's quite inventive. You can tell he's taken bits from you know, multiple managers that he's worked under. But defensively, they just don't look good. Is it, this this does seem a bit of a theme under a lot of new managers, should we say, at the mm-hmm. minute. Like, they all have a really set idea of how you should be on the ball, and they all show inexperience off it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, like... I feel like he's one that maybe could have benefited from like an apprenticeship Mm. under a top manager. Like, for example, if Jürgen had stayed at Liverpool, but Linders had decided he was going to go and take the Salzburg job, I think Sahin coming in and replacing Linders under Klopp for two or three years would have benefited him enormously. Similar to what Arteta did under Pep. Mm. And, like, we saw when he took over, he clearly had a lot of the Pep influence, but he'd also learned a lot from the other coaches that he'd worked with at City. And as he's gone along with Arsenal, and we must remember now that he's been at Arsenal a long time, like, we're approaching the five-year anniversary of him taking over. Is it the six-year anniversary of him taking over? I can't remember. He's been there a long time either way. And... He is now, only now, really morphing into what he himself is going to be as a manager, which is some sort of combination of Tony Pulis and David Moyes and George Graham and a little bit of pep sprinkled on top. Like, he's showing himself now to be more of a defensive-minded manager than what I think Arsenal thought he was going to be, which is absolutely fine as long as he gets the results. But he has heavily leaned into the defensive side of the game of packing players in and and going out with the express intent of not losing games with the hope that the attacking talent they have in Saka, Havertz, Martinelli, Jesus, Odegaard, etc., etc., Trossard, obviously, can win them games. But if they can keep clean sheets, they know it's easier to win games. Mm. Like, I, Sahin didn't have the apprenticeship. He didn't have the time to learn. And I think, I think Dortmund, I think ultimately it will prove to be a bit of a mistake, but it wouldn't surprise me if in seven or eight years when he's gone somewhere else, if maybe we do look at him and think he's a pretty good coach. Yeah, could be another two jobs down the line. So Hmm. uh, interesting to see it develop anyway. I'm not sure it's a clear reason or clear upgrade or clear... No, I think reason is the biggest one. Clear reason for getting rid of Terzic and bringing in Sahin, but there you go. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that. Like, if you, if you were getting rid of Terzic to bring in, let's say, De Zerbi, who was available, I, I could have understood that. I, I would have looked at that and thought, right, that I get, that I see as, as a a logical reason to do it. Look at the track record. De Zerbi's done well at Sassuolo. He's done well at Shakhtar. He's done well at Brighton. Sahin did okay with Antalya Spore. Like, okay, not good, not dreadful, but okay. You've brought him in because he's a club legend. Mm. That's not a reason to appoint a coach. Like, it's, look at Roma with, with De Rossi. Um, speaking of Roma, let's look at Serie A quickly. Torino top. I think that's a surprise to everybody. 
Uh, they are unbeaten, three wins, two draws. Uh, Napoli second. Looks like Conte has turned things around quite quickly and quite surprisingly, considering the situation with certain players. Um, Inter and Milan both look questionable. Milan, obviously, with the big win at the weekend. Roma, poor start, sacked the manager, not entirely keen on the new start, on the new appointment in Juric. Atalanta have been a mixed bag. Um, Cesc Fabregas has not had a great start to life. No wins in their first four games at Como. Anything standing out to you in Serie A? Um, I mean, a little bit early again. Um, not quite as early as in uh, Germany, obviously, but I think Inter in Champions League kind of look like what I expect them to be all season long. I think if they hadn't have lost in the last minute to AC Milan, obviously being the derby, I would kind of feel like they're exactly where I expect them to be. Maybe one draw turned into a win short, but they kind of look like one of the better organised teams and not with elite players. So I still expect them to be top two, top three. Looks like it might be a tight... um, season again at the top or at least in the sort of top four places that kind of thing I'm always left expecting a bit more from Juventus to be perfectly honest I know they've had Napoli and Roma in that recent spell but like you say Roma were, were not doing well seems like most of the players were not happy De Rossi got sacked anyway um, but you know we, we we expect things now from Diago Morta after a good year last year got his move got his way with a lot of the players that he wanted or didn't want. We, we've been the beneficiaries of, of, of a bit of that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that this, again, looks like a Serie A season where it looks really interesting, but it looks short of quality across the board. And basically, if anyone is more consistent defensively or just has one or two brilliant attackers, that, that just might be the difference for fourth or fifth or first or second. Yeah, it, there's a lot of parity, but no standout quality, really. I think there's some really good coaches. Obviously, Simone and Zaghi, Conte, uh, potentially Mata. It's very early in his managerial career, but yeah, I think you're right. I think it, I think it is going to be small margins to win the league there. Like if, you, um, if we just, before we leave that, since they just played each other, Juve against Napoli, you probably expect two of the top, let's say four of the season in a general mm. course of events. Right, Napoli's front four, Lukaku up top, which we know is very good in Italy. Elite, I don't think so personally, but he's a goal scorer who, who will serve them well and will score goals, right? Kvalit Scalia, great. I, I would say that's one of the few who is capable of being elite in, in Italy's top flight. Politano and McTominay, that's the rest of the support line. Like, again, I'm saying good, functional at times, Mm. decent on their day and can be match winners in a moment but more through movement industry experience physicality more than anything that makes them great and makes them able to do it week after week after week after week and then for Juve Nicolas Gonzalez uh, if you like him lots I think he's again he's okay yeah he can be good but I wouldn't go much further than that Teon Coop Miners who we like but is not elite from a technical perspective he's Again, industry is a bit like McTominay. In fact, both of them playing as basically tens. Yielders, who I do like, Kenan Yielders looks like he yeah, can be a really good player. But again, he's not there yet and he can no. be very inconsistent. And then Vlahovic, who looked like he was going to be a world beater and isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it, it is just... I think they've each got that one... Well... Napoli have a standout talent, a standout player in Kvalichgelia, and Yildas is a standout prospect in that he might become a top, top player. Like, there's a real chance, but he's still very young. Krugman is like just, for me, playing him as a 10 is just bizarre. Like, he belongs deeper. Um, I'm very curious as to why both Douglas Louise and Kevin Turam are currently holding the bench and Douglas Louise isn't even coming on in a game like that, you know, when Weston McKenney is starting. Um, can, can we just sort of, we just mentioned Yildiz and Gonzalez and Coop Miners, right? Mm. 
let's say Yildiz has to play and Vlajevic has to play. So Coop Miners and Gonzalez, um, Timmy Ware came off the bench in that game. They've got, um, who else they got there in that squad? Pajoli. Not too many others. Are you seeing no place for Chiesa there? Take away any bias of him being at Liverpool and hopefully he's pretty really bizarre. Are you, are you seeing it no place for him? No, he should be. He should not only be in the squad, he should be starting for them right now. Hey guys, it's Eddie Gibbs from Anfield Index here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast and I'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends. In the current climate, it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free. At Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community, where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, AnfieldIndexPro.com. Join today. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. You got five on it with the five dollar meal deal at mcdonald's you about to eat eat your choice of a tender juicy mcchicken or a hot cheesy mcdouble sandwich and a crispy four-piece mcnuggets and a small fries and a small drink for just five dollars five gets you more at mcdonald's prices and participation may vary for a limited time only 